I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some comments and excerpts from lectures on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. Here I want to say some things about the distinctions between idealist or formalist conceptions of literature and historicist conceptions of literature. One traditional conception of the creative process sees the author's inspiration as coming from outside the author's consciousness, as being inspired, that is, by God, or perhaps by a classical muse. Another form of idealism emphasizes the original genius of the individual author. This emphasis on the author's individual genius is characteristic of 19th century Romanticism, and also of the critical and pedagogical movement known as New Criticism in the 20th century. Something that the inspirational and the individual genius conceptions of authorship have in common is that they both mystify the creative process by locating its source outside of material and historical conditions. In the idealist tradition, Art and literature are assumed to be universal. That is, the beauty and excellence of a great work of literature should be immediately and spontaneously evident to any competent reader from any particular social historical background or life experience. Likewise, the great work of literature is assumed to be eternal, timeless. Any competent reader from any particular period in time is expected to be able to read the great work of literature and recognize its excellence and its beauty. Of course there will be details of time and place in the work of literature, but these are trivial when compared to the essential quality of the work, its formal properties, the relations among its parts, that make it timeless. In traditional historicist conceptions of literature, by contrast, the work of literature is assumed to reflect more or less directly the social historical conditions in which it is produced, or the relationship between the work of literature and its social historical context can be seen in a more complex way in which, as it functions to participate in the production of ideology, the work itself helps to produce the socio-historical context of which the work itself is a part. Historicist orientations to literature typically emphasize the relationship between the literary tradition itself and the national culture that the literary tradition has helped to form and sustain. The relationship between literature and national culture in the epoch of modernity poses a challenge to teachers of literature in high schools and universities. Because whatever the effect of the work of literature on its original readers in its original moment of production and reception, when the work is canonized, institutionalized, and made part of the school and university curriculum, it is always pressed into the service of upholding the dominant ideology of the national culture. This process may lead the work of literature to yield quite different meanings from those that it yielded in its original moment of production. The teaching of literature plays an important role in the transmission of cultural values from one generation to the next. In this way, the teaching of literature in schools and universities functions to produce subjects as citizens of the nation-state. In my view, whatever one thinks about the argument of whether literature is universal and timeless or firmly tied to its socio-historical moment, as soon as the work of literature is taught in the schools and universities, it is appropriated for a particular time and place. This can produce effects either good or bad. Consider, for example, the insidious ideological effects of the practically all-male British literary canon 
that was taught in high schools and universities until the latter part of the 20th century. It was taken for granted that great literature was produced by people like those we see here, male writers by coincidence, like Geoffrey Chaucer, William Shakespeare, John Milton, Charles Dickens, Joseph Conrad, and T.S. Eliot. Except that maybe it was not just a coincidence. Where were the women writers? Is it that there were no women writers? Were women writers just not as good? Or was it possibly that we had been acculturated, we had been trained to expect that the greatest literature had been written by men? And the women writers were there if one looked for them. Writers like Virginia Woolf, Margaret Atwood, Uki Imaketa, and Nadine Gortimer to go along with writers like Shakespeare and Conrad. In some cases, this required reading differently or seeking some different values in the literature that was read. And in many other cases, it simply meant giving the recognition that had always been due to great writers like Jane Austen and George Eliot. So in this example of the conflict between idealist conceptions of literature and historicist conceptions of literature, there are real material consequences for people. What gets taught as literature in schools and universities affects the cultural values, the attitudes and assumptions of people, and it has substantial political implications. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But if you have questions or comments, send me an email.